lifting heavy and just like being able to lift heavy things and get strong just really changed my mindset to, you know, I can do this. Like this, I'm not going to limit myself anymore. I think, um, I think as women, a lot of times we like put self limitations on ourselves and it's mind blowing because if you'd have told me like that, I would be eating this many calories a day and not gaining weight. I'd be like, you're kidding. Like, you know, significant weight. You're joking. That's not possible. And it's just crazy to actually be living it out like daily. (laughs) Welcome to the Wits and Weights podcast. I'm your host, Philip Pape, and this twice a week podcast is dedicated to helping you achieve physical self mastery by getting stronger, optimizing your nutrition, and upgrading your body composition. We'll uncover science backed strategies for movement, metabolism, muscle, and mindset with a skeptical eye on the fitness industry so you can look and feel your absolute best. Let's dive right in. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. In today's episode, I am thrilled to bring you an inspirational conversation with my client, Carol. Carol recently celebrated her 26th wedding anniversary. She's a proud mother of two amazing children and a passionate teacher. When she's not shaping minds in the classroom, Carol might be walking on the local greenway, hiking, reading, cooking, baking, or practicing yoga. But the true testament of her dedication and discipline is her newfound love for strength training. In just four months, Carol transformed her body composition, going from 30% body fat to an impressive 16%, losing 23 pounds of fat while gaining three pounds of muscle during a fat loss phase. She's mastered the art of nutrition, balancing her macros, overcoming disordered eating habits, and enjoying full and satisfying meals without feeling restricted. More importantly, she's hit significant strength milestones, bench pressing a personal max, going from one to 10 consecutive pull ups and discovering a deep-seated confidence in herself and her abilities. Her journey isn't just about personal wins, though. It's also the positive influence she's become for her children, the mental resilience she's developed, and her relentless pursuit of goals she once thought were unattainable. Carol's story is a beautiful example of the physically and mentally transformative power of strength training and fueling your performance. So, Carol, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. That was like the most glowing introduction ever. (laughs) Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, it is just the truth. And I know sometimes it's hard to hear our own like story uh, told back to us and or hard or or helpful or whatever. But um, it's really nice to talk to you in this context, because we're usually on a coaching call, right? Right. And now we get to really explore all the wonderful things that, that we've been through together in your journey. So let's talk about how you got to this moment. Um, tell us what your health and fitness journey looked like before the recent transformation and then and then leading to the moment that you realized that you wanted to step it up and do something different. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I guess I've been on this whole health and fitness journey for about 10 years, maybe. Uh, it really first started after uh, my husband and I moved with our two children to a new city. And at that time, my son was in school and my daughter started preschool. And I knew that I wanted to do something more active than what I'd been doing. And I had a little bit more free time on my hands. I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, So I started running. I just started running and I loved it. I really enjoyed it. It was a great outlet. Um, And I'd never done that before. And so I made some pretty, you know, fast gains and just really loved it. I started doing 5Ks and that sort of thing. And really got into it. My husband likes to run too. So it'd be fun to run with him. Um, And then eventually I just started doing some strength training at home on my own with dumbbells. I don't know if you've heard of Kathy Smith. I'm going to date myself here, but I had a couple of Kathy Smith videos (laughs) and I would do those like, you know, I'd alternate upper body, lower body. I just do them at home after I'd go for my jog. And, um, then eventually there was a CrossFit box that opened up, um, about 15 minutes from our house. And I was like, I'm going to do that. So I got into CrossFit. It was really fun. I loved it. It was, um, I think what I loved most about it was the community aspect because I was really seeking that and it was just so fun. It was great. And you have accountability and you have support, um, and you can like compete with each other, but it's all in good fun. So Mm -hmm. that was great. I loved it. Um, however, I guess after about three months or so, I injured one of my legs, my right leg. And I think it was because of 
deadlifts. I'm not certain, but I was essentially sent for um, an MRI. Nothing major was found. It was just, I was diagnosed with like anterior tibial tendonitis, or, you Mm -hmm. know, it was kind of Mm -hmm. like this weird, vague diagnosis. However, I didn't, I didn't have to wear a boot for like, I don't know, maybe a month. I don't really remember. And that was during the summer. So that was pretty not fun. You know, my kids are out of school and I'm stuck in this boot. And, um, after that, I just kind of thought, you know, maybe CrossFit isn't really for me. Um, and so then like I shifted more towards running again, once my leg healed and, um, Oh, fast forward a few years. So just, just, just stop you there, right? So, because this is a very relatable to, I'm sure a lot of people get into these yes. various things and myself too, CrossFit, you injured the leg maybe from something you did in CrossFit and that, that was the sole reason you stopped doing it. It wasn't anything else, right? You, you like yeah. the community and the, and all that, but thought this is maybe too dangerous or maybe not the mode of, of exercise I want to attempt. Absolutely. That's so true. Like I loved everything else about it, but then I was like, oh gosh, I got injured and I was like out of commission for a long time. And that was awful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I, like I said, I kind of, I kept on running a lot and then, um, eventually I just sort of did all running all together. I was still doing some dumbbells at home, but then eventually I just kind of stopped doing that. I, I returned to a full-time job teaching and I just didn't really have a lot of time. So like all I could do was go for my run in the morning. And that was really all the time I had. Um, and so finally, um, I guess this was maybe like a couple of years ago. Um, I was seeing a doctor at the time for just some health problems. And he, you know, he was like, I really think you're taxing your adrenals too much. You need to give the running a break. And I'm like, mm. what? I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, but I did. And so it was at that time that I really started doing the weights and I stopped running. I decided I would just walk instead of run. And then I started doing a lot more weight training on my own in the time that I would have spent running. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I did it on my own for about a year and a half, maybe ish. Um, Just doing the YouTube videos. I had a couple of channels Mm -hmm. I loved. Um, Carolyn Gervin was one and I, I would just, you know, uh, use the dumbbells and that, that was pretty much it. I do like maybe 30, 45 minutes a day. Um, and so then, um, I guess more recently was when we, about a year, maybe last fall, I should say last fall. Um, I was when I really got interested in doing it more, like just, Mm -hmm. just with dumbbells, um, And, uh, it was probably really in December that I decided I was just going to go for it because, um, we have all the equipment, um, at our house. My husband, uh, like totally decked out our garage and it's a home gym basically. So fabulous. It's so great. And I'm, I feel so lucky to have that. Um, don't have to go anywhere. It's just, you know, right there. So, um, I feel like it was maybe in December or January that I heard you on a podcast interview. With Karen Martell, mm-hmm. um, I had started working with Karen to address some health problems I was having and she interviewed you and it was like the best interview. And I knew <laughs> I was, I've got to start lifting heavy and, um, you like, you knew everything you had all the right answers. And I was like, I've got to start doing this. And, um, so I basically just kind of started out there with the barbell training going up from the dumbbells and um i've been just doing that ever since love it love it so that that whole story is um is not so uncommon i mean except the part about you know finding me and saying it was the perfect interview so i appreciate that because (laughs) um i'll I'll just uh let that let that image sit there but um you mentioned the uh hormones right you mentioned the adrenals for example and I think a lot of people do find it surprising um, when, like, if somebody asks me, uh, what do I do? I've got all this stress. I'm like, you're doing too much and maybe you should lift heavy. No, And and the confusion's often there. Uh, how does how does lifting heavy weights, you know, help with your, your stress and adrenals? And we find that the, the recovery, right? The recovery versus the stress that you're placing on your body, it just shifts in a completely different direction. And it sounds like you started to discover that. Um, and then you, you did the dumbbells and then you started to get into barbells. Now, what was it 
and, and I'm not stroking my ego here, but what was it that you heard on that interview that you're like, I have to do this? Um, well, so I've been doing the dumbbells on my own for so long and I just felt like I wasn't progressing. And I mean, there's only so much you can do with dumbbells. Okay. And okay. so I think it was really that. And I just, I felt like I had maxed out on that. And also I was getting a little burnout on it. I was like, it's getting kind of boring. You know, I'd like to try something new. And back in the day when I did CrossFit, I loved it, you know, and okay. I had just, yeah. So it just sort of reignited uh, the fire in me to get back into it. Yeah. So that's great. So it's a plateau, which I think is important for listeners because it's one of the biggest problems people have is plateaus in their training their nutrition, their physique. And it, and like you said, it, it could come from uh, doing the same thing over and over again and something not changing enough to change you. And there's something has to give, right? And you recognize that it was the load on the bar. And some, some, some people tiptoe around this, but like, if you ask me what is the quote unquote best way to lift, I'm probably going to say barbell training. Uh, and, and then you can say, well, what about dumbbells? What about bands? What about body weight? And I'm going to say, yes, yes, yes. Those are all effective for a while for a while because as you get strong it's just a function of going against gravity and like you said the dumbbells get kind of burned out because you know you have the same movements over and over again and you're not going to be lifting 150 pound dumbbells <laughs> probably right. before you probably instead switch to barbells so you know one of one of the things you did is you hit a PR on your bench right um, yeah. while we worked together you were really excited about that yeah. And I'll, I just want you to talk about that excitement as, as in the context of this so that people understand how fun barbell training can actually be. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Well, usually when I'm doing my strength training, it's it's in the morning by myself in our gym, our home gym. Um, and I don't ever have anyone spotting me. Uh, I get up really early because I have to leave the house really early to get to work. And so... Um, we were on vacation and there was a local gym that I'd looked into uh, and so we decided to just pay the one week fee and join it. And my husband and I, and then sometimes my son, we would all go together. And so since he was there to spot me, um, you know, technically it was supposed to be a deload week. Like I told mm -hmm. myself I was going to do a deload, but I was like, gosh, you know, he's here to spot me. So I'm just going to go for it. So, um, yeah, no, it was really, really fun. It was just great. Um, not only that I got a PR, but also just having the encouragement of him and then, some other folks around there, you know, um, that were watching and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's just nice to achieve a goal that you have in your head and be like, wow, I really can do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so that's been really fun. I did since then I've done, I've, I did a one rep max on my body weight for the bench press, which was pretty cool. So, that is amazing. That's a big yeah. milestone. Yeah. It's pretty fun. It's just, just so fun, you know? Hey, listeners, this is Philip Pape, and I'm excited to announce our upcoming totally free 21-day challenge starting December 1st. It's called the Wits and Weights No Diet Holiday Body Recomp Challenge. This challenge is about learning how to achieve body recomposition, that's building muscle and losing fat at the same time without dieting or restriction throughout the holidays. I'll be giving you free videos, guides, and personalized coaching in a private group chat to help you enjoy the holidays while being satisfied and guilt-free. The kickoff call is Friday, November 17, and the link to enroll is in the show notes. No matter what episode you are listening to, don't worry. If you're hearing this after November 17, you can still register and get access to the replay and resources before the challenge starts on December 1st. Again, to join the Wits and Weights No Diet Holiday Body Recomp Challenge to build muscle and lose fat without dieting through the holidays, click the link in my show notes. Now back to the episode. Yeah, so you got into strength training. This was late last year, correct? Leading into the beginning of the year. Or yeah, not got into strength training, but barbell training. Barbell training was really probably more like January. Okay. Um, because in the fall I was still doing the dumbbells and I was sure. also having I was having all these health problems and I'd gained some weight. And so then in January I was like, you know, I'm gonna do this barbell thing, you know. So yeah. yeah. So then you got into that and let's, let's also turn into the nutrition side. Cause that's a lot of where we worked mm -hmm. on together. Um, how did you, I know you found about out about me through the um, podcast, but 
the coaching practice and wits and weights and the community, you know, how did you find out about all that and, and what resonated with you and your goals? Yeah, sure. Well, after I heard your interview with Karen, um, I, of course, subscribed to your podcast immediately and I started like listening to every, mm-hmm. every single one I could. And so you didn't start from episode one, did you? I always tell people don't do that. <laughs> no, I don't think I listened to episode yeah. one, but I mean, they're so educational and so informative and you cover all the basics and it makes it very like just anyone can do this, you know, mm-hmm. like anyone can do this. And so um, that was really, I guess, where I got started uh, just listening to your podcast. And um, then I guess I reached out to you uh, because like, I mean, one thing that um, really impressed me about you was just your genuine desire to help other people. I mean, like mm-hmm. you're the real deal, you know, like there's no gimmicks, none of that. And um, I knew that I could do like a one-on-one call with you um, just as like a basic introduction kind of thing and not, not have to pay for it. And I thought this mm-hmm. is a, this is amazing. So that was when I reached out to you and we did the one-on-one and then I feel like you really, um, gave me some great guidance, like first steps, things to do to get me on the path, um, to where I needed to be. And what were those things? So what, like, what were, if you remember, what were the things that you really wanted when uh, I'll say when we started working together, cause eventually you became a client, but even in that initial call, which as you said, it's not the way I do them. It's not like discovery call sales calls. Cause I can't stand those tactics and I don't like right. the, like, let me get you in a call and then I'm going to sell you. I don't even mention that my coaching, unless you ask, but it's really like, how do we get you from A to B? Because for me, that's what frustrated me for years and years and years is just knowing exactly how to do it. And that how to do it is often not what we think. There are so many uh, beliefs that we have to to shift from what we thought to what they really are. What were the things you really wanted and, and your big goals at the time? Yeah. So um, just real quick to say something you helped sure. me learn to shift was my attitude towards training. Like I was like all in, but like too much all in, like I was mm. way over training. <laughs> like I was, I was hardcore five days a week, like, and sometimes Saturday and Sunday just never allowed my body a chance to rest and recover. So like you really helped me make that change for sure. Um, that it's okay to take a rest day and to recover. And that's part of the process. Yes. So that was awesome. Um, and then the other shift was with nutrition because, um, like any other time that I had like tried to lose weight, I would just restrict, restrict, restrict. I'm not like restrict, you know, every day, like Monday through Friday and not eat enough. And then on the weekend I'd be starving. Mm-hmm. And so then I just like eat all the things, which just, you know, I was just like totally backpedaling any progress that I've made. And it was totally not sustainable, not sustainable at all. So you helped me really see a sustainable way to pursue nutrition in a way that allowed me to reach my goals. And so like my, my primary goal was really just to lose weight um, because I, I just wasn't comfortable at my body weight. I didn't um, feel good and healthy. Um, During the fall, I'd had some health problems and I hadn't been able to work out at all for like maybe a couple months. I don't know. So Mm -hmm. that was my biggest goal, but also I just, um, I just wanted to get back to where I felt strong and fit and healthy, you know? So yeah, so so much there. So um, the first thing you mentioned was that less is more. And I can't tell you how many, I would say the vast majority of the the conversations I have with people is uh, do less, just just do less. And you get the kind of the look, really? Right? Or, or the concern that isn't my metabolism going to go down if I do less, right? And I think I even did a recent episode because I get that question so often. And it was about how working out less can increase your metabolism. So I'm glad you you took that message and found that, hey, I could have more time in my life, more re- time to myself, and uh, still make progress. Right, um, right. Yeah, when, you told me, yeah. when you first told me to do just like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like the compound movements, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was like, it's just three days a week. That's insane. Yep. Like, and, it, and I couldn't, like, it was so hard to make myself do that, to only do three days a week. But But it definitely was what I needed. It is. And it's, it's counterintuitive to me to this day too, Carol, it really is. And and there are some strength training programs that are like, just do, you know, heavy singles or triples twice a week and do one movement, you know, eat, and you still make progress. And it's crazy to think that some of these things work, but your, your growth in your strength and your muscle is really an adaptation, right? It happens 
as you sleep. It happens as you recover. So if you reframe and say, what, what my lifting session is giving me the most maximum stimulus possible as short time as possible so that I can let that recovery process work. If I'm working out seven days a week and if I'm running every day, I'm just constantly interrupting that process and never letting myself. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's right. what I've been doing, which was just ridiculous. So, yeah. 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 And then the nutrition, the mm -hmm. weekend binges, um, also very common. And, and, and I say common, Carol, right? Because I, I want the, you've got a lot of listeners who I know are going to learn from this conversation. Just like you said, um, the podcast likes to cover the basics and teach you things that anybody can do. Carol did this. Anybody listening can do this. And the things she's going through are the things that a lot of people go through. Um, the weekend binges where uh, I, people say, I don't understand why I'm gaining weight or not losing weight. I'm really good Monday through Friday. And you don't realize how much you deviate on the weekends. Right. <laughs> right. Whether it's, was it, I don't know if it was alcohol or just mindless snacking or just going out. Like, what was it for you? It was pretty much, it was, there was some mindless snacking for sure, but yeah. also like just some emotional eating tied to yes. like just daily stressors, you know, like just the buildup of stress and things like that. Um, it's just like self-sabotage, you know? So yes. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, some, somebody said recently on a show on another podcast, I was listening to that, you know, emotional eating is a learned behavior. It's a learned yeah. behavior. And it sounds like you were able to un either unlearn it or learn something to replace it. So I don't know if that's a simple thing that occurred for you or if it happened over time, but what do you think was the catalyst for that? Well, I think just the process of um, really dialing into my nutrition with you, and especially once I started using Macrofactor um, mm -hmm. and eating enough calories on a daily basis and like not feeling restricted and um, not feeling the need or like the want to overeat on the weekends because it was all good, you know? Um, so that really, just that process really taught me a lot about emotional eating and the triggers for it and, you know, what's the cause of it. And this is why it's because you're over restricting. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So you became aware of what you were doing and that awareness itself sounded like it already unlocked the vast majority of that, that journey, right? Because so many people just don't know what's happening. And now that you know, and now that you're tracking, and, and this is important because people think tracking is obsessive or causes disorders. What All that is is bunk, right? We know yeah. from the evidence and from experience that unless you have a prior disorder, tracking only helps, like tracking your budget, right? Like tracking your schedule for your meetings and tracking everything else makes you aware and gives you control. And then the other thing you mentioned was eating more. And that's the other thing that's mm -hmm. counterintuitive for people is so many people are not eating enough. And if you eat enough and let your body you know, relax and de-stress and not restrict. Now all of these other issues go away. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'm just, par I'm just paraphrasing everything you just said. It wasn't a question, but it's good to reemphasize how important all of these are. Um, okay. So I think about a four month period, um, you've gone through uh, mostly a fat loss phase during that time. And just so the listener understands, like Carol is lifting, you know, she's lifting properly with progressive overload. Um, she's you know, pretty self-disciplined that I, in my opinion, like there's different levels of discipline people have just naturally. And not that discipline and willpower necessarily have to be high for this to work. That's where accountability comes in. But she's been able to take the things we talk about, like the sleep and the stress and all that and go and execute to that. Um, but, and that allowed her to start a fat loss phase fairly quickly. It wasn't so, and I say that because not everybody's ready. <laughs> not everybody's ready for fat loss on day one. Right. Um, and some people call it a cut, whatever you want to call it. So share the experience of navigating fat loss, right? The challenges and roadblocks, because it's not easy. Let's be honest. It's not, right. not even fun always. <laughs> Let's just right. be honest. It's, it's, a, it's an extreme in a way. It's a, it's a deviation from the norm that we want to live every day, but you have to go through that process occasionally. So how was that for you? Well, I mean, you are right. It's not easy, but also it wasn't nearly as hard as I thought it was going to be. I have to say like macro factor was the best because it just does everything for you. You just punch in the numbers and it tells you what to do. And it's fabulous. So I just like, I followed that to a T I'm really detail oriented. So I love tracking and like keeping up with everything. You know, I just, I love that. So I basically, I just did what macro factor told me to, and every week it would cut my calories by a little bit more. But it wasn't by these huge amounts every week. You know, it was just like maybe 100 calories. Some weeks it was only 50 calories. And so 
gradually I would just, I would make the changes. I would sub in something for something else that, you know, had less calories. And um, as I went along and I learned a lot about which foods make me feel the best um, with the least amount of calories. So that was Mm -hmm. pretty cool. Um, And I was like, I guess maybe, I think it was week 14 of the fat loss phase. I think I was down to 1400 calories and I didn't, I never even had to go below that. Like I didn't have to, I thought I was going to have to go down to 1200 or something. Mm-hmm. That's a number to me that sounded really un, <laughs> unmanageable, but um, it was great. And I, and, I and started, you're fairly petite, let's just say, I mean, I, we don't have to necessarily share all the details unless you want, but you're fa- I just want people to understand you're fairly petite. So 1400 yeah. calories is is not bad really in a deep into a fat loss phase. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm like 53, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. It's important yeah, to know yeah. that, right? Yeah. Yeah, so like that was not bad at all. And the other thing that I really um so I've always been someone who likes to eat mindfully because I have a history of some digestive illness. Mm-hmm. Um and so I really usually always try to eat mindfully when I eat for that reason, but this really like dial that in big time because like if you eat slower then you're going to get fuller you know and like it really taught me the importance of just like eating slowly and it really helps you like savor every bite and really appreciate what you're eating because you know Mm -hmm. that that's all you're getting (laughs) so um so yeah honestly I was really surprised at how um once all the pieces came together like working with you and using macro factor um and of course, the barbell training, once all the pieces came together, I was really surprised at like how effortless it seemed. I mean, I, I really, I, I really did not anticipate losing the weight that quickly. And that was pretty cool. Love it. Yeah. And I saw that progress. Um, we can, we can put it into numbers in a second, but you were surprised at how effortless it seemed. Um, and just, is there, is there one thing that sticks out of, out of all of that, that was the most important. So I I know it's a lot of things and sometimes people feel overwhelmed, like, oh, I have to track and I have to train. I have to this and this and that. And and ultimately you want to incorporate all those practices, but is there one or two things that were the most important out of those? Um, so yeah, like for sure tracking, but also, um, just having the mindset that I was in this to be successful. Like I, like, in the past, anytime I'd ever tried like to lose weight on my own, I would always just, I never would succeed. Like after a little while, you know, I just, I would never have any success and I'd give up. I just give up. And so this time there was just this mindset change that was like, I am going to do this. I can do this and I will do it. So I think that was really important to just keep in my head. Um, and also, I mean, it's when when you can see the progress, like, um, since I was lifting heavy and you can see the progress from week to week, it's motivation to keep going. So many good things here, Carol, right? So the first thing is the mindset to be successful, but not doing it on your own. I think that's important because I don't know about you. I have, I have all sorts of coaches, mentors, teachers in my life, whether I pay them or not, they're all over. And I seek them out because the fastest way that humans usually grow is getting feedback as you go Mm -hmm. through a process to see what your mistakes are and how you can improve. And so you knew (laughs) if we got in a call and like things were just all out of whack, I'd let you know and we would dial them in. Right. Yeah. And and oftentimes what that happens, especially for a client like you again, who has that natural self-discipline is you'll just then go ahead and make it happen so that you don't get called out (laughs) in front of your coach. So there's all different styles. Some people it's more reactionary, right? They kind of, you know, make certain choices and then have to get um, schooled a little bit, you know, in the coaching call, which is all good. Or you tend to have that in your brain, like, okay, now I'm going to be talking to my coach, so I better get it all in gear. But then by doing that, you got results and those results motivated you. Now that's the awesome part of this, because that means we don't have to be working together for 10 years. You know, you're going to be able to go on your own uh, and and do it because you know that the results are going to happen. Like you have certainty that a lot of people lack. So so awesome. Um, yeah, yeah <laughs> good right. stuff. Absolutely. And like, like any doubts that I ever had about that, like I would just reach out to you and you just reassure me and you'd tell me what to do and I would do it. And it was just, it just worked like magic. Yeah. Like magic. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is like magic. I, I feel the same. Um, even, even when I, I go through the process myself and make choices, I'm like, wow, that actually, you know, works. <laughs> it's biology. <laughs> um, so it put it, to put it in numbers for folks, I alluded to this in the intro. 
you lost 20 pounds from 140 mm-hmm. to 120. Okay, so there's your weight. We're mm-hmm. going to just put it out there. Right. Um, including a massive 14% loss in body fat. And so I want the listener to understand the incredible numbers here because when we talk about gaining, maintaining, and losing, generally people who have some training under their belt, they might be able to re- do some recomposition at maintenance. Generally, they, it's very hard to gain extra muscle in a, in a diet, right? In a fat right. loss phase. I think, I think this is my theory is that because you just started really pushing the weights properly in January and then shortly after when your fat loss phase, you were still in that newbie gains phase sure. um, from a stimulus perspective. And then you were in a fat loss phase. So you, if we take your percentages and we do the math, you lost 23 pounds of that 20 in fat, meaning you gain three pounds of muscle because like it would be negative otherwise, right? Right. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's cool, right? So, so just again, for the listener, she lost 20 pounds on the scale, but she actually gained three pounds of muscle and lost 23 pounds of fat. So you got leaner upon leaner. <laughs> yeah, doing like that. I never thought about it that way until you said that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's like the holy grail of body composition, right? <laughs> right. And, and now, of course, Carol's going to potentially go into a building phase and might gain a tiny bit of fat in the process at some point if she builds and then if she cuts again, you know, she might not be able to necessarily gain this gain muscle, but she's already gained all this muscle to, to keep in the future. Hey, this is Philip, and I hope you're enjoying this episode of Wits and Weights. If you're looking to connect with like-minded listeners on their health and fitness journeys, come join our free Facebook community. It's a supportive space where you can share your experiences, ask questions, and access free guides and weekly trainings. Just search for Wits and Weights on Facebook or find the link in the show notes. Now back to the show. So did you get stronger while losing that fat? Like, it sounds like you gained mass, did. but did you also gain strong, get stronger? I did get stronger. Yes. Okay. I am. Um, yeah. I, I track all my weights and everything and how much I'm lifting and I always do progressive overload. And yeah, like I could, I could still lift heavier almost every week um, yeah. with my, yeah, with my lifts. So that was pretty cool. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that besides your individual advantages you may have genetically, it tells me that you had enough recovery, that you were mm-hmm. getting good sleep, that you were probably also moving enough to keep your energy flux high so that you keep the calories high. And thus, the calories could fuel what felt to your body like less of a diet. Right. right? Absolutely. Less of a yeah. diet. I think mm-hmm. people need to understand that because more and more I want to talk about that these days is, is the idea that even though you're dieting, what's important on the diet is the deficit, but you don't want to, you don't have to be in that deficit at a ridiculously low number of calories. Right. You know, you could be on it at a higher number if you do these other things and sleep's a big one. Like, I think you were pretty good with sleep, right? It is. Sleep is huge. Yes. It's big because I've seen people literally jump by 200 calories in their expenditure when they start getting more sleep. Yeah. You know? And so now if you're Mm -hmm. on, that's 1200 versus 1400 calories. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think the other thing that made a difference for me was just my daily walks. Like I walk every single day after school. I stop by the yes. Greenway and I walk for like anywhere from 45 minutes, maybe an hour if I have time. Um, and I think that really helped me as well. You were averaging 10, 12,000 or even a little more? Um, probably about 12,000. Some days yeah. maybe 15, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, walking is so underrated. It's like yes. the best therapy. <laughs> it's great. It is. You're, you're right. It has so many benefits besides just the expenditure. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can listen to podcasts. You can think. <laughs> what, do, what do you like to do when you walk? Well, I, of course, I love listening to podcasts for sure. But I also really just love um, finding clarity in my walk. Like if I'm if there's something mm-hmm. I'm kind of like struggling with emotionally or trying to figure out um, but just being in nature really helps bring clarity. And it also just is such a great de-stressor. It helps me feel so much better. That is good. You're you're speaking to me, Carol. Um, yeah. You know sure. what you know what I do sometimes. I will start off listening to a podcast, mm-hmm. and then my brain starts to get distracted with some other thought that's been niggling there and just waiting, right? And right. I'm like, okay, stop the podcast and start to explore this. And I will literally talk out loud. Personally, this is I do this. I will talk out loud in the middle of no, you know, nobody can hear me to kind of process through the thoughts. And you're right; it's kind of your own therapy it <laughs> while is. you're walking. So, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Which you can't do as well. I don't want to claim you can't do that while running. You probably you can to an extent, but there is that right. extra distraction of like focusing on the running too, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So then we 
transitioned to the maintenance phase, right? right. Using a recovery diet, which just to mm-hmm. clarify for folks is is when you come back up to your current maintenance and you could do it right away or you can take a few days, but it's the it's not reverse dieting, which is kind of the older idea of like slowly coming up over like weeks and not ever quite getting to your maintenance. So, and you mentioned we use Macrofactor, which mm-hmm. lets you know how, what your expenditure is. So, when you started your diet, it might have been X, and now it's X minus whatever. That's your current maintenance. Um, it brings its own challenges going to maintenance, doesn't it? Right? It does, yeah. Ph- physiological, physiological. So, how did you manage? Like, how did you deal with that? How did you sustain your success coming out of the diet so that you didn't just like binge and go back to your old ways, you know? And then, um, so that the listener understands how to ma- manage that transition. <laughs> Right. Sure. Well, something just like struck a chord in me. It was just like, I've worked too hard to get this far. I'm so invested in it. Like, I'm not going to go and just blow everything um, after I've worked so hard. And also, I have to say, this is something that I didn't expect. Like, when I when I went into maintenance from the fat loss phase, I was just gradually increasing my calories because it was like a huge jump for me to go from like 1400. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, was it 2200? I think it was such a huge jump. And I could not physically eat that much food. I got so full so fast, I guess, because maybe my stomach shrunk. I don't really know. But it just was not possible for me to eat that much food. So Mm -hmm. like, I would get so uncomfortably full. And I just felt awful. And then I'd have a stomach ache. And I'd be like, okay, I'm not doing that again. So Mm -hmm. um, so I went kind of slow with bumping up my calories. But again, I am I think it was also, it's like, wow, I get to eat more of this and I get to eat more of that. And this is so exciting and so great. Like who, who gets to do this? And I just really, um, like I said, I just didn't want to blow the progress I'd made. And honestly, I knew that if I overate, I would feel awful physically. Mm. And I just did not, I want, I didn't want that. So, yeah. Yeah. So the part about upping your calories was for the 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 psychological and the biofeedback aspects, which are exactly the reasons we would do it that way, right? As as we talked about on our call. And um, but but just to just so people know, like, like v- reverse dieting it normally is intended to uh, avoid overgaining weight. Mm-hmm. Right. And in your case, we're simply avoiding you feeling terrible <laughs> <laughs> by jumping too much, which is the right way, the right reason to come up not uh, instantly by, like you said, it was something like 800 calories because you were in a, a fairly aggressive deficit. It was the appropriate deficit for you, but it was fairly aggressive. And then the second part you mentioned was this idea of now all of a sudden it just seems like a, a buffet of calories available to you, even though this is what's required to maintain your weight. And actually, it's probably going to go up from there as you recover. I mean, right. what what were you th- were you thinking that you would like not be able to eat enough at some point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I I honestly was. There were some days yeah. like I'd be like I'd be looking at Macrofactor, being like, okay, how many more calories do I need to get to this? And my husband's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm trying to eat more, but I just don't. Need to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I do want to say there is this piece um, of it, as, but you know, especially with women and the scale, like. I will readily admit I had this little, you know, fear of like seeing the scale weight go up and I did not want to see that, you know, it's like, I don't want to see it go up. And so Mm -hmm. I think also there was just this like mental piece, mental roadblock to get over and be like, it's okay if it goes up, it's really okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we did talk about, and and that's being aware, right. And being, uh, Mm -hmm. understanding of what's going on with the body. Right. Cause when we look at, a if you gain two pounds overnight, and I say this all the time, like it, yeah. it doesn't mean you gain two pounds of fat because you would have had to overeat by 7,000 calories. Exactly. Well, you're not even eating to your maintenance yet. So logically, and I know the logical brain, emotional brain, they, they fight a lot. Yeah. Logically, that's not possible. So what's left? Well, we know it's left. Fluid, glycogen, the carbs, the food in your gut, the food you know being digested. Uh, maybe inflammation because you're training harder. And that's not even to count, uh, you you know, your cycle if you're a woman and other things. Right. So um, we talked about that. And and if you're listening and you're coming out of a diet and you go back to maintenance and you're doing it the right way, you're probably going to gain, what, two to four pounds, most people, maybe guys a little bit more than that. Is that about what you you, uh, saw? Yeah. You know, it's really funny. Um, I actually like, 
sometimes my weight would shoot up by a couple pounds, but then the next day it drop a couple pounds. Like, yeah. in fact, that just happened recently. Like my weight shot up by two pounds. It was after a, I had horrible insomnia and I was stressing about going back to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the next day it was back down two pounds. So I'm, I'm really like, I guess overall, maybe I, maybe I've gained a pound. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. You know? And, and at your, at your weight, that actually does make sense, right? Like being 120 a pound, whereas like, a 200 pound guy, it might be two or three. Right. But the, yeah. And the point is, it's like, it's insignificant. And it also yeah. is, has nothing to do with fat. It's just you regaining the fluid. And now you're sitting there, you know, you're just sitting there with all this food and that's your new maintenance. And that's the beautiful thing. Cause you have muscle mass that's giving you this and muscle mass and movement yeah. and contributing to that. <laughs> exactly. Cool. And it's mind blowing because if you'd have told me like that, I would be eating this many calories a day and not mm-hmm. gaining weight. I'd be like, you're kidding. Like, you know, significant weight. Mm-hmm. You're joking. That's not possible. And it's just yep. crazy to actually be living it out like daily. <laughs> yes. Pretty yeah, well. we see it all the time. And and everyone's different. You know, again, everyone responds at different levels mm-hmm. and everyone has a different, you know, like Carol's doing everything right. I would say, uh, you know, for the most part, like doing all the things, quote unquote, optimally um, it, as best you can. And some people will struggle with some more of these things, but always know that it's in your power. Like the choice is there that you have mm-hmm. these toggles and that you can make the change. So important message. I mean, super inspiring. Um, you mentioned also that strength training has influenced your mindset and it increased your confidence. Like I want to touch on the mental resilience part because I think that's really important. Um, and I think you said, quote, gain a mental edge with the hard things in life. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, that is so true. Um, so it just um it has definitely brought me a lot more confidence. I've I've never really had a ton of confidence in myself and um and just my profession, I think, um, has made some of those things a little more challenging for me. Um, and so lifting heavy and just like being able to lift heavy things and get strong just really changed my mindset to, you know, I can do this. Like this, I'm not going to limit myself anymore. I think, um, I think as women, a lot of times we like put self limitations on ourselves. Like we impose these limitations that we cannot do X, Y, Z. Um, why? Like, just because we've never done it, you know, that doesn't make any sense. You can do anything you set your mind to. So I think the fact that I could like, um, you know, say for example, hit a PR on my bench press was like, Oh my gosh, I, if I can do this, I can do anything. Like I, I am capable um, I'm strong, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally, and I can do it. Yeah. I mean, you never hit, you never pushed anything like that above you in your life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now you did. So you did something right. to make that change. Yeah. Um, I want to sit with that a bit because it's, you know, it's a, it's a cliche, right. To say like, well, you can do anything and put your mind to it. not building what you said, what I'm saying, I'm, you know, people use that as a cliche. Right. But there's something about when you're effectively by yourself. This is a solo activity. If you think about it, even though we're in a community and you have coaches at the end of the day, when you press that bar, it's you and your muscle fibers in your mind. Right. Yeah. Right. And you're like, well, this is, this is pushing stuff around and now I can change my body by pushing stuff around. Right. Exactly. And how does that, how does that translate to other things? Like, is there something else you mentioned the confidence at, at work mm-hmm. and others? There's something else you noticed you changing how you approach it. Um, I think like sharing my opinion and speaking my mind about things in the past, I'd always be a little hesitant. Um, okay. I'm so I'm a peacemaker and I, 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 I really avoid conflict, you mm-hmm. know, just by nature. And so inserting my opinion, um, yeah, there could be conflict, you know, and I didn't want that, but so I was always, I was always so hesitant to do that, but now I'm like, yeah, I'm going to say what's on my mind. Love it. Yeah. I love it. Just, just from that, you know, that's awesome. Um, that's great. Okay. So I, I, what, I don't know, I don't know why I have this question in my notes here, but, um, one of the three pillars of self-determination theory, which we talked about with Eric Helms a while back, um, Mm -hmm. the others are autonomy and and competence, but one of them is relatedness, which is being part of a community. Okay. Now I know I wanted to talk about this. (laughs) Okay. Um, how has being part of a community, since we just talked about how lifting is a solo activity, but at the same time, everything you're doing is a part of a community, how has that influenced your journey and 
how could listeners find their community? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, being part of the Wits and Weights community has been like, it's been so supportive. Um, it's really helped me grow like with like-minded individuals and feel like I have something in common. Um, there's accountability. Like when you did that shape up for spring challenge, it was so mm-hmm. much fun. Um, I loved that. And so um, it just gives you the impetus to keep going when you're maybe not really feeling motivated. Um, and I think, I mean, there's so many groups out there and I, I just, you know, on social media, whatever, on Facebook, there are so many groups out there that are just waiting for you to join and that are there to help you. And, um, so I say, just reach out, um, especially the Wits and Weights community. It's great. It's great. And also like, um, you learn so much from other individuals in the group. It's fabulous. (laughs) Um, I mean, you know, Alan, for example, who's in our community, he has taught me so much about mindfulness. And I love that, especially as an educator. And so it's just you never know what you're going to end up getting from the group. Yeah, that that's a good that's a great point. Just the idea that there's fresh perspectives, knowledge, and there's some characters, you know, there's some fun people, there's yes. some jokesters, there's serious folks. Um, we've got some people that are like really serious lifters and you know, they'll <laughs> they'll kind of like um in a positive but but humorous way, you know, let right. you know what you're doing wrong, which yes. is fine because we're all there in a kind of a safe space to help each other learn. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. And something else that's really cool is like, you know, form checks. Like if I wanted to video myself and post it, I know that everybody would give me advice about my form on a lift. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then of course, like, you know, the, the once weekly things, or maybe, I don't know if it's once a week, but you always do um, a live recording weekly and it's always on a topic that's pretty helpful, you know, like nutrition or fitness or mindset. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. 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 If we were to continue this, the infomercial here, cause I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to over promote, uh, the stuff, but what Carol's talking about is you could ask a question and I'll answer it live on Friday. And we're talking about not just a generic question that I would answer on a podcast, but actually your situation. Like if Carol came in and said, this is, these are my lifts. These are my macros. This is this, this, and I'm struggling with this. What, what should I do? And I'll give you a specific answer. So Mm -hmm. definitely, I don't know how many groups do stuff like that, but we are there to help. Um, okay. So what about, um, you mentioned stress a little bit before and chronic stress, um, and how this process helped with that. How did that work? Um, well, it was a great avenue for some stress relief, you know, like just pushing around a bunch of heavy weight. (laughs) It's really great. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there is like, it's very different from like running, but there is an adrenaline rush to it, you know, like, um, it just feels great. And, um, so when I work out stress that way, as opposed to like ruminating on something or worrying about it, or, you know, um, it just, it solves a lot of problems for me. Nice. Nice. So just the act alone of the lifting Yes. de-stresses you. Cool. It does. Yes. Yeah, yeah and, for and, sure. And, and it, yeah. You know, it takes your mind off whatever you've yeah. been stressing about, you know, because you're yes. focused on your lift. Yeah. And would you say how does it compare to like a high rep, more endurance style lifting session? Because both I think both release endorphins, right? But running and endurance will release more of those in the moment, but they also kind of wipe you out. How, right. how do they compare? Just so people kind of get the differences. <laughs> Um, how do they compare? I think, honestly, I think with lifting heavy, it's for me, like I feel more accomplished. Mm. Like after a run, I'd be like, oh, that was a great run. You know, it was a great run. Um, but after lifting heavy, it's like, wow, that felt amazing. Like, it's just, I don't know, for me, it's just a different level of accomplishment. I'm with you. I'm with you. When you said that you struck deep in the heart of me because you're right. Like it's not a lot of reps. It's not a lot of volume. You take all this, all these rest periods. If anything, sometimes when you get started, you feel like you're not doing much. But but then when you do that one lift that's heavier than you did last time, you do it successfully. You're like, whoa, like I just lifted more than I ever lifted in my life. And then you do it again and again and again. You're like, this is something, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Versus just, okay, I ran again for half an hour. Maybe I ran a little faster. <laughs> right. I mean, anyway, I could get a little cynical about this stuff sometimes. Um, uh, I, and I think there is a there is a mechanism of chronic stress reduction just from lifting anyway, but from mm-hmm. the muscle mass, like you mentioned, the adrenals and the hormones, there is all of that wonderful stuff. So I'm I'm sure there's that. 
Right. Um, what would you say to all the women over 40 or anyone of any age, but you know, we're sometimes focused on that demographic who are wondering how to get started and get the results that you got or the results that they're looking for? Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, keep it simple. You taught me that. <laughs> keep it simple. Um, do what you can with what you have. So like if you don't have access to a gym or barbells, for example, start with dumbbells. That's great. Mm-hmm. It's a great first step. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just start with something. Um, you can even do your own body weight until you have dumbbells, for example. Start doing something to get you on the path to success. And it can little things you know, they add up over time. Um, like don't overdo it. Don't, (laughs) you know, don't set yourself up for failure, take rest days, recover. Um, make sure that you know the importance of that. And, uh, yeah, just start small, go after it and, and you can do it. Love it. Do something, keep it simple. Exactly. Yeah. Also, yeah. I just want to say, uh, I know for me, like it was kind of hard to figure out a structure to my fitness routine. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm a planner. I plan my training sessions out every single week, every Sunday afternoon, I plan out what I'm doing for the week. And initially when I got started with you, I wasn't really sure like which program to do, what should I do? And so you gave me some great options. Um, and thinner, leaner, stronger is really awesome. And also right now I'm currently doing, um, the program stronger that was put out by um, Katie and Heather off of stronger than your boyfriend. Yeah. Um, And that one's great too. And I mean, like they're all good and there's so many good ones out there. Um, So find a program that you like and stick with it. Absolutely. Um, And, and there's different ones for different people, even though I talk about a few that I think are highly effective because for me, look, I'm, I'm lazy, like in, in the sense that I don't want to waste time. I want to get the results as fast as I can, um, you know, without burnout, without all the other things. And so that's what I will recommend. But like you said, start with what you have. So I will definitely get people that say, but I just absolutely can't get access to a barbell no matter what. No gyms have it. I can't get it. I can't fit it in my house, this and that. It's okay. It's okay. Don't stress. Like there'll be something. And I guarantee that once you get started with something that is way more effective than what you're doing now, even if it is not Mm -hmm. optimal. Um, the results, like you mentioned before, Kara, are going to inspire you to get creative and figure out how to keep going. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what about on the coaching side? So this is where, again, mm-hmm. I, not everyone can afford a coach, of course. And may, there are a lot of people who are self-starters and who are very self-motivated and they can read a book and they can go and just do everything perfectly and have great discipline and willpower. The other 95% of people... <laughs> <laughs> um, like you said, maybe I've tried many things over the years. I'm in this camp as well, tried many things over the years. And it wasn't until I started getting help from somebody um, that I started to make more progress. So if someone's on the fence about, about strength training in general, but hopefully we, they're convinced of the value of that listening to the show, but on working with an online coach, for example, what's your advice for that person who's you know wondering about that? Sure. Yes. I would say just do it. Just like take the plunge and do it because I wish I had done it a long time ago. It would have saved me, you know, just some struggles that I had with previous attempts. Um, Just do it because like for me, I I have a tendency to overanalyze things. And if I'm out here floating on my own little island, I'll overthink everything to death and then like Mm -hmm. spin my wheels and not get anywhere. But with you, I could just shoot you a message, you know, and you would respond right away. And then I knew exactly what to do. So just do it um, and you won't regret it. And it took you four months to get amazing results, right? Yeah. yeah. Think of it, and think of that in the scheme of your life, of right. years and decades of your life. And so anyone listening who's like, once you make the decision to do that, to accelerate the process working with a coach or getting help or whatever it is, whether it's in a group program, uh, an individual coach, um, you know, something that your insurance pays for, I don't care. You know, think the results are going to come pretty quickly in relative terms, right? Right. Yes. Um, it's it's and, definitely yeah. an investment worth taking. Yeah. Because uh, if I, if I asked you on who's listening six months ago, where did you say you'd be today? You probably said the same answer you say today. Not, not you, Carol, because you've gotten your results, right? But to someone, right. if I say, where, you know, where do you want to be in six months? Ask, did you ask yourself that question six months ago and get the same answer? And six months before then, get the same answer. In which case, there's maybe time for a change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? sure. That's the way I look at it. My eight right. years spent in CrossFit not doing anything. That's the way I look at it. Right. Um, 
All right. So, uh, and then as far as working with a coach, how does someone make the most of that process so that they know that, hey, from day one, they're actually getting what they need out of it? Um, I just, to make the most out of it, just, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to your coach anytime, Mm -hmm. anytime with anything. I mean, they, I mean, coaches, especially you, you you know, there's just a wealth of information. So it's like, take advantage of that, you know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I have clients who all they use me for is like an encyclopedia (laughs) and, and guess what? That, that works for them because they couldn't have found that they couldn't have Googled or chat GPT that information and got exactly what they needed you know, in two seconds. And I think that's important because I use all those tools as well. But I know that Mm -hmm. if I'm struggling as a business owner or as a, as a husband or whatever, and I I just need an answer for me, (laughs) that's going to work. It's great to have a friend, a a coach, a community, even if it's, again, even if it's a free community, it doesn't have to be a coach, right? It could be in a community, go ask, you know, uh, Joe or Susan, right? Like the question and they'll give you the answer. Yes. Yeah. 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 So true. So what has been the most surprising result of this entire process? Um, the most surprising result. Um, well, I, you know, it was really s- surprising that everything happened so quickly. Like that definitely surprised mm-hmm. me just with the weight, the fat loss. Um, but I think just how, how stronger I've become and how I'm, able to lift heavy. And that's, that's really been surprising because ever since that first injury back with CrossFit, I just over and over, I tell myself, I can't lift Mm. heavy. I can't lift heavy. I can't lift heavy because X, Y, Z happened, you know? And, um, and I mean, my leg still flares up every now and then, but, Uh and, but I had to jump that hurdle and just say, I can do this. And so, but I think that really has been the most surprising that yeah, I can. And I do. And I did it. And it's great. And how, what do you want to be doing when you're say 90 in terms (laughs) of strength? See, now that, now that you've transformed your identity in a way, um, think about it. Like to the, to the day you die, what do you want to be doing that, uh, for your, you know, that demonstrates your strength? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would still love to be lifting. I've never really thought of myself <laughs> lifting at 90, but I would really love to be doing that. Just being active, you know, just yeah, staying yeah. active. The, the wonderful thing is that you can, that's the thing that's right. the, out of this whole process, you can be that person and buck the trend, buck the trend of the, again, 90, 95% of people when we see walking around as they get old and, you know, frailness sets in and disease and everything else. Mm-hmm. So in the short term, you've gotten the physique you wanted, but you've also gotten strength and health in the long term altogether, which is wonderful. Definitely. Um, I, I'm inspired by you. So I know I, I, I'm talking a lot and not asking as many questions, Carol, but it's just wonderful to, to see this. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, a question I'm going to ask next. It's the penultimate question of the interview. Okay. What question did you wish I had asked and what is your answer? All right. So I, I thought long and hard about this one and like, one of the questions I get a lot from people when um, I tell them about my routine is how do you get up so early? Uh, and uh, I do get up, I get up at 4 a.m. because I have to leave my house at 6.45 to get to work. And so um, I make my strength training a priority in my day. So I get up really early. But also um, one thing that has made a difference for me is I read a book called The Miracle Morning by oh, Hal Elrod. You've probably yeah. heard of it. Uh, he's got a fabulous podcast. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with who he is, you should check him out because he has a really inspirational story. He was in a car accident, nearly died, was in a coma for like six days and made this transformational comeback. So he wrote Mi- The Miracle Morning and um, he's got this acronym. I think it's SAVERS and it's like so each morning, the goal is you set yourself up for success by doing each of these little things as part of your daily routine. Um, the S stands for silence. Um, and so this is like meditation. The A is affirmations. Um, so every day I write down a daily affirmation, um, you know, like I will or I can or just something that is affirming for me. Um, the V is visualization. This is where you like visualize yourself going throughout your day successfully. This is great when you're yeah. lifting heavy to like, visualize yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, the E is for, oh, oh, exercise. Yeah. The E is for exercise. And of course I do that in the morning. And then the R is for read. So he's a big, you know, like self-help 
read a book about something, you know, to help yourself grow. And then the S stands for scribe, which means write. So then write in a journal. So um, I read that book a couple of years ago and it really just changed my whole morning routine. And also something else he points out is like the night before, tell yourself that you're going to wake up ready for the day. Like make that mindset change the night before. And like, even if you know that you're not going to be getting much sleep because you're going to bed late, you know, tell yourself you're going to wake up and be ready. And so um, it's really cool to like be successful with all those things before you even leave the house. And it just sets up your day much differently than it otherwise would, at least for me. And so um, that would be my answer if people ask me how I get up at 4 (laughs) a.m. Yeah, no, love it. There's definitely, there's like morning lifters and afternoon lifters, you know, and and I read that book years ago too, and we all take something different from it, but you are, you are right that like starting your day off on a good solid footing, thinking ahead, planning ahead, sounds like you get your day ready ahead of time and you're in control, right? You're just like in Mm -hmm. control of your outcome. Um, and that's what this is all about. So Definitely uh, to all the 4 a.m. lifters out there, you know, um, take Carol's advice and still try to get the sleep, you know, at a decent yeah. time the day before because yeah. it will catch uh, yeah. up to you. <laughs> I, yeah, I go to bed at like eight. So there is that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if how lifts heavy weights. So we got to get them, you know, training, but all the other stuff. Um, so, okay, where do you want listeners to learn about you and reach out to you? Sure. Um, well, I, I am in the Wits and Weights community. So folks are able, to reach out to me through there and I'll be happy to help you respond to any questions, just support you, uh, cheer you on in your journey. Yeah. So I'll include the link to that. And then so folks can join and find Carol. And if you can't find her, just post or reach out to me and say, where's Carol, you know, so we can reach out to her, but it should be pretty obvious. Um, Carol, this was fun. The time just flew by. I love uh, everything about your story. It's just teaches us how uh, resilient our our minds are and our spirits and how we can change at any age, no matter who we are, no matter where we're studying, no matter what we've done in the past. And uh, just thank you so much for sharing your experience. Oh, thank you. This was so much fun. It was an honor to be on your show. So much fun. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wits and Weights. If you found value in today's episode and know someone else who's looking to level up their wits or weights, please take a moment to share this episode with them. And make sure to hit the follow button in your podcast platform right now to catch the next episode. Until then, stay strong.